ladies and gentlemen, understand the form of journalism that we do. This is a journalism we should feel proud. And I see so many of you in this audience today who I greatly respect. And I want you to know, Jerson is sitting there, I want you to know, Jerson, this journalism was not spawned in Delhi. This journalism that we do has been born out of lower parel, Jerson. And this is the journalism this country needs, not that journalism, Jerson. We change the rules of journalism. Sitting in lower parel, I feel the news. In 2011, and all those who have been journalists will know this, we sit in a newsroom and we are told that there is no story today. So we sift through the papers and we find that there is a story where a 16-year-old girl has been raped by her employer. She works as a domestic servant. This happens, Mr. Ramadurai, much before, much, much before uh, Nirbhaya. This girl is 16 or 17 years old. She works as a domestic help in the house of a MLA in Lakhimpur Kheri in a village called Banda. And this man rapes her. So she's a gutsy girl. She goes to the police station. When she goes to the police station, this, she tells the SHO. SHO says, what happened to you? She says, I've been raped. Who raped you? The MLA. Which party is the MLA from? I think it was a person called Purushottam Divedi or something. I don't know his exact name. But he was from Mayawati's party and Mayawati was in power. Right? The brother of the MLA calls the police officer and within minutes the girl is locked up in jail and she's vegetating in jail for two weeks because some trumped up charges of theft or whatever are put against her. So much before Nirbhaya, much before a shallow movie like called Peeply Live was made, much before all that, 10 to 20 to 30 OB vans of TV channels land up in Banda and out of the relentless journalism, first the MLA disappears, then he goes missing, then Mayawati responds by saying, I won't do anything. But after 10 to 15 days of that journalism, the MLA is picked up and he's put in jail. What happens as a result of that, a trickle-down effect, that girl, once she's out of jail, forms a self-help group of women who call themselves the Nagin group. They dress up in black and they go to another village to help another rape victim. This is a 17-year-old girl who feels so empowered that the media was on her side, helped her fight an MLA, that she forms a group and goes and helps someone else. This, ladies and gentlemen, we talk about trickle-down development. In my view, this is absolutely true trickle-down social impact in our country. This is the journalism that we want to spawn in this country. Now, if I reduce the story of Banda to the inside pages, page 11 of a newspaper, or if I reduce it to a small mention, and if I do not do a debate on it, and I spend one minute on the channel on it, trust me, the system is so unjust, it is so unfair, that far from getting justice, that woman would have genuinely been languishing and many other rape victims would have never dared to speak up. This is the journalism that we have spawned out of a studio in Lower Parel. This is the journalism which I want to grow. This is the journalism which if it has to grow, has to grow in the great city of Mumbai and nowhere else. Please understand what we do. When we do this in 2010, a set of papers come to my hand in which it is revealed that there is some kind of a lacuna of 250,000 pounds in the audit related to Her Majesty's Treasury Department into the Organizing Committee of the Commonwealth Games. Now I want to share a little secret with you. We had no idea about this 2G scam, CWG scam. But you make a assessment that if people are there in London and have 500,000 pounds to spend and they end up making some 250,000 pounds on a margin of 50% as a corrupt practice, if the same bunch of individuals is given 100,000 crores to spend on the Commonwealth Games, you presume they would make 50% of it, which is 50,000 crore rupees. Did we have the papers on the CWG scam? We did not. Did Mr. Suresh Kalmadi help us break the CWG scam? He did. When we broke that story of the 250,000 pound auditing mishap or whatever it was, the gap, 
Mr. Suresh Kalmadi, next day in Delhi, did a huge press conference, if you remember, where he said, this is wrong, I will expose these people, I will file cases on them. And he would not let any Times Now reporter speak. I was watching his entire press conference, and I asked myself, what really is he trying to do? And I asked myself, he's overreacting. And I came to the conclusion, a person overreacts only when he has something to hide. It was four days after that that we actually got all the papers related to the CWG scam, which is why I am till today eternally grateful to Mr. Suresh Kalmadi for helping me break the CWG scam. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this journalism, this journalism was not born in Delhi. This journalism has been spawned and supported and it has grown in the city of Mumbai. And I want to ask you today whether you feel proud at some level that as Mumbaikers, you in your city and the environment around your city, the professionals from your city, a group of Mumbaikers are consciously every day trying to change the parameters of journalism in this country. I want your support and I want it more actively today in the future. Around that time in January 2011, the Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, did what he usually never does or did. He had had enough of these scams, Dr. Manmohan Singh, and he decided that he has to take this head on. So he decided to speak. And he had had enough of us, so he said, I'm going to do a live press conference. This live press conference was organized at the Prime Minister's residence. It was one of my first times in the PM's residence. I'll cut the long story short. There were 14 editors asking questions to the Prime Minister. One of the big scams which had broken a few days earlier was something called the Devas Hisro scam. There was the 2G scam before that. There was the other scam. There was the CWG scam. And I know many people may have mixed views about our coverage of these scams. I believe we are genuinely doing a social service each time we broke those scams. And I hope that the media in this country will have the courage that if these scams were to come up again, we should come on the front foot irrespective of who likes it or not, and question any government or any individual or any politician or any bureaucrat in power. Nevertheless, I was person number 13 who came to ask for the questions. Before that, everyone was giving the Prime Minister advice. Somebody would say, Mr. Prime Minister, you know, this is this about the economy. You can do this. You can improve this. And the Prime Minister would nod very gravely and say, thank you very much. A very good suggestions. And I was sitting there, itching my hands, wondering when anyone will ask a direct question. The person, the editor, two editors before me, even asked a question, what is your message to Sachin Tendulkar? And I asked myself, I said, have I landed from another planet? Or have they got it all wrong? What is going on? This whole country for seven months before that, Every day the raging headline in the country is scam, this scam, that scam, and you have a, editors who are sitting here, the Prime Minister of India is sitting, and the first question you ask him is, Prime Minister, what do you have to say to Sachin Tendulkar? Anyway, when my turn came, there was a gentleman who didn't like me very much, called Harish Kare, who was the media advisor. I had barely opened my mouth and asked the first line of my question when he told me, this is not the news hour, that you can't interrogate the Prime Minister of India, this is not an inquisition, etc. The Prime Minister looked at me in a puzzled way. I decided to take advantage of the situation. And I said that, Mr. Kare, I think the Prime Minister wants to speak. The Prime Minister, therefore, having been challenged in that situation, and I hope I'm not being impolite, but I can't censor myself. And Shishi, since you called me, you ran the risk of this. So the Prime Minister took up my challenge. And he picked up a piece of paper. There were four pieces of paper with a written answer on the Devas Isro scam. It was that question where I asked the Prime Minister that whatever the compromise may be, because he kept talking about alliance politics holding him back. And I said, but you cannot compromise with corruption. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, that was the most fundamental thing to ask the Prime Minister of India. I have seen in the, in, in the United Kingdom, when that entire scam about the Rupert Murdoch, that whole news of the world affair happened, the Prime Minister of India was standing, uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is there and a journalist asked him, why don't you just admit that you messed up? In fact, he didn't even use the word messed up. He used a more ruder word. 
But that's how journalists speak to the Prime Minister. In our country, for some strange inhibition, we have made the media some part of a cozy club, a cozy relationship with the establishment, where you are with the establishment, for the establishment, and by the establishment. And when the greatest pursuit is not giving the truth to your audiences, or the truth to your viewers, or the truth to the, to the readers, but simply becoming part of the establishment. I believe that while it is not the job of the media to constantly fight with the establishment, it is the job of the media to have an adversarial relationship with that establishment. And I feel that adversarial relationship has not happened. I believe that in the last four years, and I'm saying this to you as one Mumbaiker to another, that you should feel genuinely proud that the experiment in media to give a new respect to the media, to the television media, which was not being taken seriously, to create a back to basics campaign, to a back to news campaign, where even Hindi news channels today do less sap CD. There are a few people who do Sansani at night, but less sap CD. But you are doing serious news, where people are watching serious news. And trust me, I don't interview film stars on the news hour. I pick up serious issues. And we ask those questions every day. We try to do the journalism that we can. It's an incipient stage. It has all happened where? But in this city of Mumbai. So what do I tell you today when you ask me, what can the media do for the growth of Mumbai? I now come to my very specific proposals. I know at the end of it, all that people want to feel is feel empowered. I feel empowered when Ashok Chavan calls me and says, stop covering the story. He didn't say it so nicely. Am I revealing too much, Ashish? You see, when the point comes when you want me to shut up, just tell me, I'll leave. And remember this, Shishir, I do a news hour, which over the years, due to different reasons, is becoming a news two hours. And there is a time when the producer says at about 11 o'clock, enough or I'm going home, and I decide to stop. All people want is a sense of empowerment. I, I want the media to take risks to be that voice. You see, I told Ashok Chavan when he called me, stop covering the story. I said, I have no personal agenda here. But you have used the name of Cargill. You have used the name of Cargill. It's not a story of environmental violations, you see. If you carry it as a story of environmental violations, nobody in this country will be concerned. But the moment you called it Cargill for profit, and you brought, you challenged the people at top of the system, you don't challenge somebody lower down, you see, which is why I say that Sanjay Baru, it's interesting, he chooses to write a book exposing the Prime Minister during the last two, his last two weeks in office. You want to question Manmohan Singh, you should have questioned him when we were questioning him. At that time, you were on the other side. Anyway, I don't want to get on that. I believe that we empower the people when we make the Chief Minister of Maharashtra understand that neither he nor anybody else can in direct, indirect, conscious or unconscious way use the name of Kargil war widows. I'm not talking of a legal definition. They use the name of Kargil Goa widows to justify that mammoth building and give themselves the profit. So they use the name of Kargil for profit. That's one sense of empowerment. I empower the media because we ask the questions and Ashok Chawan resigns. A Raja resigns, Kalmadi steps down, right? Kanimodi is out of office, people are in jail. None of this would have been expected would ever be possible in this country. Once again, I ask this audience, close your eyes and ask yourself. Six years back, if you were here and someone were to tell you all these people would have resigned, Ashwini Kumar would have resigned. What was that railway minister who was, somebody was doing deals in his residence, Mr. Bansal? who lost again to a Mumbaikar, he resigned. Would anybody believe that people would have been made accountable like this? They wouldn't have. So I empower myself in the media, and I empower people in this country who genuinely believe each time they have to pay a bribe to get ahead in the line, I empower them to believing that if people at the top can be questioned, then the system can change. At the root of all of this is a very positive sentiment which says this country can still change. That is it. Question number two, people need to be empowered. In this city, I remember the story of Keenan and Ruben. And I had to plead to Prithviraj Chavan, literally plead to him, 
When I called him, I said, Mr. Chief Minister, will you come on air with the father? And Mr. Chawan said, no, no, you know, it's all going to be complicated. I said, there's no complication. All you need to do is share a voice of compassion and empathy with the family. So people know that you are there for them. I took a lot of convincing. Mr. Chawan came that night. I don't know what happened or whether the promises were fully followed up. I know a lot of them were. But I, I think it was very important that the chief minister came and shared his thoughts at that time. That too is my job as a journalist, not just to expose, but to be the link between people who are losing out and the people who forget those who are losing out. All this, this form of journalism, which if followed up seriously, can change this country in many positive ways, is happening from the city of Mumbai. So what can, what can I contribute as a media person to this city? I can't contribute my expertise, neither am I an engineer, nor an architect, nor a landscape designer. But what I can certainly say are four things. One, I met someone who said, from Denmark, who said we are creating land banks in Mumbai. I want to ask you here today, are we willing to create a media city in Mumbai? If there can be a film city in Noida, which is the center of news broadcasting right now in this country, I just want to give one thought. And why not? It doesn't take much space. Can the people who matter do something to create a media city in Mumbai, which can, if Times Now is here, if anybody is here, you genuinely can take baby steps towards it. All you need is the encouragement this city has the skills, you see, and the reason I'm telling you, and I'm glad, Mr. Ramadura, I see you taking notes. It's a very serious suggestion from my side. My first point is create a media city in Mumbai. Let this be a place where nobody says you can't have land. Encourage media organizations, the broadcast industry, the digital news industry, the print media industry to work and operate out of Mumbai. If you allow that, if the government takes steps towards that, I think it will be a big step forward. Secondly, if you do that, you will become the internal nerve center of the country. I felt this because I've often felt a very patronizing attitude towards Mumbai. I, I, I saw this after 2611 when people came out on the streets and people in Mumbai were asking questions about terrorism, the country's security policy, etc. It was all dismissed as some kind of socialite candlelight march. I saw in that tussle a sense that the people of Mumbai should contribute as the financial capital of India, but not have a stake in the intellectual debate of this country. I think the time has come to change that. By making Mumbai the media capital of the country, you can make a huge difference in that. Point number two is a very, very specific suggestion. I'd like to say this that the digital media is the future of the media in India and globally. Sir, I can tell you having interacted with media professionals, all the professionals in digital media and in news, in television, the technical and editorial and content people would love to work out of a city like Mumbai. This city is somewhere not opening up those opportunities. Sir, remember this. Kolkata was once considered to be the media capital of India. It lost that space somewhere. And it has never been able to regain it. That place has now gone to Noida. I would like to see a shift from Noida to Mumbai, where Mumbai becomes the media capital of the country. The third point, and I always say this wherever I go, is the big dream. I share this with you. You think it is possible because I think it is. That in the next five or six years, before the turn of this decade, Broadcasting industries and a channel and a global news enterprise will be born out of this country so big, so powerful, so editorially competent, so aware, so connected. It doesn't take time to build those organizations. I believe the next big global media organizations of the world will be born out of India, out of Mumbai and will give the BBC, the CNN, the Al Jazeera's of the world a solid run for their money. 
I am predicting that this will happen very, very soon. I know this country understands English. We are brilliant in technology. Our costs are far more efficient. We produce well. The television we do and the news we cover, trust me, I go and watch global channels. For all we say about our country, we are more vibrant as a news and television media than anywhere in the world. Don't you think it is time to give the BBC and CNN a run for their money? Why should the global thinking enterprise be run out of London and Atlanta? Why should it not be run out of Mumbai and Bangalore? I see that happen. And therefore, my third suggestion is this, and I'm closing with this. And I remind you of the three points I've made. Let me recap again what I have said to you. My first point is I'm extremely grateful to this city. If this city has helped me build my career and build a channel, it is waiting, waiting passionately for many more people like me, maybe 10 years younger, to do it all over again. Will this city encourage those people? Secondly, and this goes out to all the journalists out there, we have changed the rules of journalism in this city. Can this city now change the game of journalism at a global level? Will this city now see a new media city grow up and a global channel and a global digital news enterprise spawn? I think it is just around the corner, ladies and gentlemen. For your support, you know, for your love, for your affection, and for your viewership, Though sometimes I must say this, that I ask someone, why do you watch me? A person looks at me in a puzzled way. I say that you can be frank with me. Is it for news or for entertainment? Younger people who are frank, they say it's a bit of both. I say I don't mind as long as you watch me. I I'm very grateful for you for watching me and for supporting me. If you feel at any point of time that I have done enough, anything to ruin my credibility and your faith in me, call me and tell me to stop. But till then, please support me. I have a group of 21, 22, 23 year old journalists. Please come and visit our small little studio. It's a small place in Lower Peril. I feel so proud of it, you know. And there are, my news editor is 27 years old. Sir. My, my senior editor is 29 years old. I said, you are the, you are the youngest senior editor in India. These young people are working very hard and they are very, very, very passionate and they are scrupulously honest people. They don't take a safety pin. You will never see a Times Now person accept a free pass or a gift somewhere. We don't talk about great journalism, but we're actually practicing it. I want you to own that journalism. It is for you. So please support it and please hope that when you call me five years from now, a little bit of the dream that I have shared with you becomes a reality. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.